<clears throat> Red Bun means we're live. Some casual takes episode 74 hosted by your boy, Stephen Pepper here to casually talk sports. This episode is brought to you by no one. We have a good show today. I've been off for a week. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get my schedule figured out, but now I feel like I'm in a good place. I'm trying to make no promises because every time I make a promise, um, some like school schedule gets in the way, but I really want to start pumping out more podcasts. Got a good show. Monday Night Football, we're going to talk about Lakers game, of course. Then I want to give you guys who I think the best team in the AFC is, and James Harden's Clipper debut was also last night. I'll give my take on that because last show we talked about the James Harden trade. Now he made his debut a week later, so let's talk about it. Okay, so let's go to Monday Night Football first. The Chargers, New York, play the Jets, Monday Night Football, and they beat them 27-6. to six. A little sip of water already. I'm a little exhausted. Okay, sports media is going to blame Zach Wilson today for the Jets' cringeworthy offense. But we should be blaming the Jets' organization instead. Listen, we all know Zach Wilson's a bust. I can't blame a bust for playing like a bust. What do you want? You're going to, yes, the Jets put up six points. The offense can't score a touchdown. What are you going to blame Zach Wilson? How? You wanted to play like Aaron Rodgers and score 20 points? He's not that good. We know that. Don't blame Zach. Blame the Jets. Rodgers tore his Achilles three plays into week one. We're going into week 10. Blame the Jets for refusing to replace one of the worst quarterbacks in the league. They had time. They had time, weeks, to get a, a, a replacement for Zach Wilson. How many show episodes on this show that, that we were saying, okay, it's time to get a replacement for Zach Wilson? They had time, weeks, versus the Minnesota Vikings, smaller market, a significantly worse defense, saw Cousins suffer the same injury as Rodgers a day before the deadline and got a QB. The Minnesota Vikings, smaller market, less expectations, worse roster. Cousins has the same injury as, a, as Aaron Rodgers literally a day before the deadline. No weeks for a backup plan or oh, time to make a trade and find a direction for this team. Got a quarterback. And that quarterback that they traded for, Josh Dobbs, three total touchdowns in a win on Sunday with zero time to repair. Didn't know any of his teammates' names or the playbook. Had a couple days just to figure out his jersey and got the win. When has Zach ever had three total touchdowns in a game in the NFL? Josh Dobbs just did so. The Jets' defense this season has seen Allen, Mahomes, Hurts, Herbert. Those are four of the six best quarterbacks, in my opinion, in the league. They've given up three touchdowns and forced eight interceptions. Guys, Justin Herbert, who I'm very high on, 16 for 30, 14 incompletions, 136 yards, zero touchdowns, got sacked five times. And they lost by like 20. <laughs> How? How? An average Jets quarterback gets this team in the postseason. An average quarterback. Minshew, uh, Brissett. Winston, Dobbs, they get this Jets team in the postseason. Zach Wilson, you had your nice little insanity run where you played um, the Chiefs close. You beat the Eagles. You beat um, – and then you had some layups against the Broncos, Jets. Went on a three-game winning streak. All of a sudden, you're four and three. I guess the Jets thought they could make the playoffs. No. The Bengals are back. Some other teams that are behind you are still better than you. They just don't have a Zach Wilson. Zach's just a hard watch. Like – Zach Wilson is so bad that the game felt over after an early punt return from the Chargers to have the Jets go down 7 nothing. You know you're bad when an early 7 to nothing deficit means the game's over. Like how can how can the Jets like talk themselves into believing in Zach Wilson to be their guy when a pre-snap penalty on 3rd and 3 makes it 3rd and 8 and the drive just feels over? What quarterback Burrow, Allen, Mahomes, even like a middle of the pack, like a golf. Like even like a golf, a Geno. Third and eight, you feel like you can pick up a third and eight. Seven point deficit isn't hard. That's not hard, especially when it's literally like five minutes into the game. Third and eight, they'll have a full start, a holding. It'll be third and eight instead of third and three. The drive feels over. Getting the first down on a third and long feels impossible with Zach Wilson. He was missing layups all over the field last night, across the middle, slants, drags, ins, layups that he just overshoots, sails, can't hit the guy right on hand. I know his receivers had some drops. I think Uzman Zam had a drop. I think um, 
Coughlin might have had a drop up. Rodgers, this guy, Lazard, wasn't that particularly good last night. But still, like he had this one play where it was to Garrett Wilson across the middle. They were down 14. Now, first of all, 14 feels like 35-point deficit when Zach Wilson's your quarterback. But they were down 14 with you know timeouts, about like eight minutes, six minutes left to go in the game. He connects with Garrett Wilson on a slant. Garrett Wilson's fast, finesse wide receiver. Who knows if Garrett Wilson just breaks that for a touchdown. Now you're down seven with timeouts, pressures on the charters to pick up some first downs. Game looks winnable, but he misses a layup. The Jets have two offensive touchdowns in a single game once all year. They can't put the ball in the end zone. Absolutely allergic. I mean, they dropped a touchdown last night. I think it was Coughlin or it was Mazama. I mean, it was just, that's just who they are. They just can't score a touchdown. And it's not like one of those teams that it's like they're allergic to scoring a touchdown. It's not like, it's not like the allergy where you just get like a little rash or like a little stomach ache. It's one of those allergies where like your throat closes up and you need your like EpiPen now or you're going to like die. That's how allergic they are to scoring a touchdown. Wilson's got three fumbles last night. He's got like, I think, eight or nine in the last six couple of games. Not good. And his best stats, I know he said he threw for like 200 some yards. His best stats were against backup defenders because the Chargers were like, oh, we're down 14. We're going to rest every single player on our defense. If the Chargers are playing Burrow, Allen, even like Goff, they're down, they're up 14. Bosa and Mack are never coming out of the game. Never. But since it's against Zach Wilson, even on the road, they pulled their starters. Now, I know I'm ripping on Zach a lot, but I know Zach's a bust. He is a bust. We should, like, I'd rather have Rodgers on crutches in a walking boot than Zach Wilson. And I know the offensive line is not that good for the Jets. Those are had some drops and some holding calls. They had a lot of pre-snap penalties. But today, everyone in New York is going to put all the blame on Zach Wilson. All the blame. And it kind of sounds like that's what I'm doing, which is kind of true. You got to blame Zach Wilson still because he's still the number two overall pick and he's starting for this team. You got to blame Zach Wilson somewhat. But like at the end of the day, you got to blame the Jets for not replacing Zach Wilson. Everyone in the world knows he's a bust. Everyone knows he can't play. Watch your TV. The Jets have played so many primetime games in Zach Wilson's life that everyone can watch Zach Wilson know he can't play. It's hard to watch. It's You got to blame the Jets for having nine weeks to get his replacement and not being able to. Got to blame the Jets. You can blame Zach Wilson all you want. Got to blame the Jets. All right, let's go to the Lakers. Oh, my God. I don't really want to talk about this segment. I was so frustrated last night. I had a lot of things to do. I had to do so much homework last night and then a lot of extracurricular stuff because I'm also – like, if you guys don't know also why I don't put, put out a lot of podcasts and I'm trying to, it's because outside of homework, I do so many extracurricular activities. And I got a new announcement coming soon that uh, stay tuned for that I'm also working on. I got a lot of stuff in my life to work on. So I was frustrated and stressed out last night, cramming in a lot of assignments, but I had to watch Monday Night Football on top of this, the Lakers game. And I was just, oh my God, just watching the Lakers again, inability to come through when I needed to in the clutch. Same old, same old. LeBron kicks the corner because he gets triple teamed in the paint because the big man has a help side. Kicks it out to a wide open shooter in the corner. He misses it for the win. It was just a frustrating loss, man. The Lakers lost 108, 107 in Miami. And now they moved to three and four. Do you want to know why the Lakers are three and four and winless on the road? Because this team is still overly reliant on the 38 year old man that they have no idea what to do when he's off the court. The Lakers are plus 10.5 per 100 possessions when LeBron is on the court, but minus 37.3 with him off the court. I said this last week. The Lakers are just not a good enough shooting team and a perimeter shooting defending team, especially early in the game, to create comfortable leads. How many three-point battles are the Lakers going to lose? <laughs> How like Are the Lakers ever going to win a three-point battle, especially early? I mean, I remember Gary Harris was just smacking them threes at uh, that one game, the first game against the Magic, the one the Lakers won. The Lakers in the first quarter, pay attention to the first quarter. The Lakers, the teams the Lakers play always come out hot, hit like four of six threes, five of seven threes, five of eight threes against the Lakers. Lakers are already down in the game. They're lucky they're a good enough pink team because that three-point battle could get real ugly. But what I mean by especially early is look at, like if the NBA only played the first quarter, the Lakers' record is 1-5-1. And, and all those losses, by the way, were by double digits. The issue is, without a, without, the, without a team that can create a decent lead, 
when LeBron comes back, the Lakers just can't survive the inevitable opponent scoring scoring run when LeBron is off the court. They're not good enough shooting wise to create a decent lead. So when LeBron comes out, they can't survive the inevitable opponent scoring run when LeBron's off the court. So when LeBron does come back in, you're asking a man in year 21 to try his absolute hardest to claw out of a double-digit deficit every single time and play the entire fourth quarters every single night. And this is not good for the Lakers in the long run because you saw last night, final two minutes, LeBron looked absolutely gassed. LeBron has played the most minutes in fourth quarter and overtime in the league. He is 38 in a month. This is not good. This is a guy who's had injuries last couple of years and been load managing. And you're forcing him to play his heart out to climb out of double-digit deficits in the fourth quarter every single night. This is not sustainable. The Lakers just have zero offensive identity without LeBron James on the court, especially when Anthony Davis is either hurt or not overly assertive on offense. The the thing is, like, I don't like blaming Darvin Ham a lot because he seems like a scapegoat, but I had this one issue with Darvin Ham where and LeBron less lineups. D'Angelo Russell is also not on the floor. The thing is, when LeBron's on the court, who runs the offense for the Lakers? Oh, D'Angelo Russell's a pretty good facilitator, but Darvin Ham likes playing D'Angelo Russell next to LeBron. So when LeBron's on the court, there's also a good chance D'Angelo Russell's not on the court, which means this also hurt. The Lakers also have backup guard issues. But when D'Angelo Russell, when LeBron's on the court, no D low, that means their two best facilitators are not on the court at the same time, meaning when it's an Anthony Davis led lineup, Who's the facilitator on the team? They got no one around the offense. And also hurts when LeBron's not on the court. He is still, it amazes me that at age 38 and soon to be 39, he's arguably the best downhill transition player in the league. He's still elite at it. It's crazy. LeBron's responsible for all of the Lakers' fast break points. Who runs fast breaks? Who leads transitions, three-on-one, two-on-one opportunities, and scores in the fast break when LeBron's not on the court? Can't tell you a single person. It's not Anthony Davis. He's too big. It's not anybody else. That's an issue. So, again, the issue with the Lakers, the reason why they're three and four, I think they're fine. I'll always say they're fine until we get to the All-Star break. Getting to the All-Star break. I said last week, listen, this team is just not good enough. I think we kind of overestimated the Lakers. They're still good enough. They still have a championship winning ceiling. But as far as the regular season, I think we kind of overestimated the Lakers offseason by trying to put them as like second, third, fourth seed. This is more of a five, six, maybe seven seed this season because they just don't have a good enough shooting to blow teams out or get comfortable enough leads. And they're not good enough as and since they're not good enough offensively when LeBron is on the court and they don't have that lead when LeBron comes out of the game, they cannot survive the inevitable run that the opponents always go. It's like routine. It, it, it's routine. LeBron comes out the game, in come huge run by the opponents. I mean, the biggest run, the biggest difference in that game was a third quarter run that the Heat set went about about like 13, 14 points in the third quarter when LeBron wasn't on the floor. And then LeBron James had to claw himself back down double digits in the fourth quarter and play the entire fourth quarter, which is not good for Lakers in the long run. Maybe their backup guard, I know their backup guards are hurt, like Gabe Vincent, Huchifino. Maybe that would help rotationally, but I need to see more D'Angelo Russell's playmaking ability in a lineup with Anthony Davis and not LeBron James. Uh, put LeBron next to Reeves. It's clear that LeBron likes playing with Reeves the most. He trusts Reeves the most on the team outside of Anthony Davis. He loves Reeves. That's his guy. I want to see LeBron with Reeves and then D'Lo with, with Anthony Davis because Darvin Ham loves playing Anthony Davis re- uh Reeves lineups and D'Lo LeBron lineups. D'Lo LeBron by themselves is just not a good fit. They're both playmakers. You got to put a pl- playmaker in each lineup. Why, the, why are the Warriors so good right now without Steph Curry? Look at the Warriors plus minus without Steph Curry. It's really good. And the reason is because they have a facilitator, a guy who could run an offense off their bench in Chris Paul. The Lakers don't have that. They just don't. Maybe when Gabe Vincent, Huchifino come back, we will. But as of right now, the Lakers are losing because they simply can't run the offense without LeBron James on the court. LeBron James last night was terrific, 30 points. Like, I'm just I'm just t- taking this man in for I, – I can't take this man for granted, man. Like, 30 points. <sighs> so many amazing dunks, transitions, stare downs, energy, and ones, blocks from behind on Tyler Hero. Vintage LeBron moments you're still seeing in year 21. Don't take this man for granted, but it seems like the Lakers kind of are. 
All right, let's go into some football, and then we're going to end with James Harden. So I want to talk football. We're at the mid-season mark, uh, which means, okay, this is November. We kind of start knowing who teams are, so I can kind of say, oh, who's the best team in what? Who's the MVP? Who's this, what? Mid-season, who's the best team here? Who's the MVP here? So the Baltimore Ravens completely smoked the Seattle Seahawks 37-3 to on Sunday. And if you were to tell me, who the best team? If I had to make a Super Bowl pick, who's coming out the AFC right now? I'm picking Baltimore. The Baltimore Ravens are the best team in the AFC. They just beat two quality AFC. They just beat two quality NFC teams. The Lions, who coming in the game, everyone thought was a dark horse NFC team, and the Seahawks, who were in the before coming in the game, the NFC West leader at home by a combined seventy-five to nine. The Ravens honestly could be the best team in the entire league, but just in terms of the AFC, think about their competition. The Chiefs have an iffy offense if you double-team Travis Kelsey. The Bengals, Lamar has played them well in his career, already beat them in Cincinnati this season, and with the Bengals' September hole that they stuck themselves into, a potential playoff matchup with the two teams would most likely be in Baltimore. Buffalo's defense is thin, and you don't have to worry about the Bills because they always beat themselves. Jacksonville just doesn't have a consistent pass rush to get to Lamar. And Miami, bro. They haven't beat a good team since last year. That's the AFC comp for the Ravens. The Ravens look like the best team in the AFC. Now, I can rave about Lamar all I want, but this team's success starts on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, we're talking about a guy, we're talking about a defensive unit that's first in opponent points per game, first in sacks, first in QBR, third in interceptions. That's how great this defense is. They have a lot of. Just a lot of guys, Gino, just a lot, Jermaine Clowney, just a lot of guys who are good at football, who can get to the quarterback, the defensive line, the secondary, uh, Roquan Smith and the linebacking core. This defense is good. 13.8 points per game allowed. I mean, I think they're off to their best defensive start since the 2000 Ravens that won a Super Bowl with Ray Lewis. First in sacks, 35 sacks, nine interceptions. I think I think Gino, their diff, their corner. I think he's got six interceptions. This team takes the ball away, sacks you. You can't move the ball in this team. Can't put it in the end zone. If you open up a Merriam-Webster dictionary, look up the term complementary. That's the, you'll see the Ravens' offense. Five hundred and fifteen total yards of offense against Seattle. Lamar, it's clear he has made strides as a passer. He's no longer just a running back. He's first in completion percentage, fourth in yards per pass, two in interception percentage, first in rush yards per game, and third in rush touchdowns. Now, I know criticism about Lamar this season is, oh, he doesn't have that many passing touchdowns. Well, if you watch the tape, it's he has low passing touchdowns on the season because they're an excellent running team. Nearly three, two yards shy of 300 rushing yards against Seattle in three touchdowns. This team can just run all over you. That line of scrimmage can just push you down the field and burn so much time and move the chains. 29 first downs and 40 minutes of time possession for Seattle. And the receiving core, too, is coming along. They're playing much better than they did earlier. Mark Andrews is still one of the premier tight ends of the league. Odell Beckham Jr. finally found the end zone. Um, Zay Flowers is looking like a young, nice piece. They got guys. Gus Johnson is finding the end zone repeatedly now. Gus the bus. And they got this, they got this guy who Keaton Mitchell, who barely played all year, put up 138 on nine rushes, had a touchdown. <laughs> Baltimore just got guys in the backfield. They just got guys who can run all over you. It also helps when Lamar Jackson, uh, who I guess doesn't have to be the team's best running back anymore with this backfield, um, also can still be one of the best rushing quarterbacks, if not the best rushing quarterback in the league. He had 60 yards. He looked great with his legs. But just Lamar has just been so efficient this year. I know the yards are low. The touchdowns are low, but watch the tape. They are a run first team that just pushes the ball down the field so easily with the ground attack that they aren't asking Lamar Jackson to throw 50 times a game for 300 yards and have all these touchdowns, kind of like he did in his MVP year. The difference between Lamar and his MVP year in this season is because if you remember his MVP year, whenever they got close short yardage situations in the red zone, they would throw, which, which gave Lamar Jackson a lot of passing touchdowns. But in this season, whenever they get in short yardage situations, obviously we saw in Seattle, this team is running the football and they're getting in the end zone. Gus Johnson had two. They had three rushing touchdowns. This team can score. 
it, it, like, and this might be the best team in the NFL too because Lamar Jackson, like, as soon as he plays an NFC team, he has like a ninety-five percent chance of winning. He's eighteen to one against the NFC. So if he go, he has to play an NFC team in, in the Super Bowl. He could very well win that game because he doesn't lose to NFC teams. I think his only loss was the, the Giants. That's a fluke loss. Like he's nineteen. He's, he's realistically like nineteen to zero. That's a fluke loss. That's Giants. But that's how good Lamar is against the NFC. So if he can beat the AFC, which looks like he can, he's already beaten the Bengals. Now that Thursday night football rematch against uh, in Baltimore, Bengals Ravens is going to be key. I think that's going to decide the AFC. Uh, the Chiefs always have the hat in the race till January, of course, but I think that's really going to decide the the AFC. But if we're looking at Baltimore right now, like this team has really no flaws. You can say they might need a bit better receivers, but they run the ball extremely well. The defense is one of the best in league. You'd have the best in league. I mean, stats say so, first in so many other things. Lamar playing clean football, not turning the ball over through the air, accurate completions, efficient. They're running the ball for 300 yards a game. And when you look at the, look at his opponents in the AFC, Chiefs, no wide receivers. Literally no offensive identity if Travis Kelsey is being double teamed. Lamar plays the Bengals so well. I think he has above 500 record against the Bengals in his career. And then Buffalo, come on, they beat themselves. That defense is thin. Josh Allen ill-advised turnovers. The Bills have no identity. Jacksonville is a scary team. I like Jacks. I think they beat the Ravens last year, Jacksonville's a scary team, but they, outside of Josh Allen, you know, the, the Jacksonville's Josh Allen, they don't have a consistent pass rush to get to Lamar. And Miami, like Miami's not, we, we don't count Miami anymore. We, we saw the Miami game this journey. I'm so, I'm so disappointed that I couldn't have a podcast yesterday because I would have absolutely ripped into Miami. I've been saying this about Miami. They're just not a real team. They can't be anybody good. But this is a complimentary team that the Baltimore Ravens are. That's that's the best team in the AFC to me. Until someone can prove going to Baltimore, which looks like they can't lose to. I wonder, oh, by the way, I wonder who's the only team that beat them at home. Bye, Colts. <laughs> Cry. Um, but unless someone can prove to me, like that Thursday night football game, that someone going to Baltimore and just beat the Ravens, and the Ravens, you know, can't run the football, then until then, this is the best team in the AFC. This is the best team. All right, let's move in. Last topic, James Harden's Clipper debut. He made his debut last night in Madison Square Garden against the New York Knicks. And the New York Knicks spoiled his debut as the Clippers lost 111-97 to to the Knicks. I saw a couple of people on Twitter saying, oh, wow, how fitting. James Harden's return to the Clippers, they instantly lose. They lose by like 14. Relax. It's the first game together. Don't put too much stock into this game. They lost by 14 to the Knicks. Relax. It's their first game. On the road, too. Madison Square Garden. It's loud. They went on a run last night in the fourth quarter. The Clippers had multiple leads in this game, by the way. They had a six-point lead at one point. They had late third-quarter leads, early fourth-quarter leads. The Clippers were leading in big spots in this game. It's not until like midway in the fourth quarter, the Knicks got on that run. Madison Square Garden crowd hyped them up. They started hitting a bunch of threes. That they pulled away. It was competitive to like mid of the fourth quarter. It's their first game together. If you're with a new company or you're with a new friend group, it's going to take a little bit to gel. How about you play like any real basketball team? Like I, I play in real basketball with my friends. First game it takes a little bit to gel. It just does. Simple as that. You don't have team chemistry. It's kind of weird. You just don't have, you're just not good enough yet as a team. And James Harden said it last night. Harden said it felt weird. I mean, no training camp. No preseason. Harden literally said he was just winging it. He kind of just stuck to what he knew as a player in the last couple of years playing in Brooklyn and playing in and Philly, like kind of that skill set, that style of play that he's been playing. Harden kind of just played with that. He had no, he had no like way. I hear people outside my room, but Harden just had, you know, no chemistry with the team and it showed. But I think they played really well. I think Harden, the value that Harden is going to bring to this Clippers team. It's going to show in a couple of weeks. And I th- I already think it started showing last night. Harden, he was a good 17 points, very efficient, passed the ball, gave him that facilitation. See, this is what Harden can do. He had some great plays as a passer, gave you six assists. I think that's going to go up. 
and he still gave you 17 points. He can still push 20 points a game. That's what Tardin can give you. He was 20 and 10 last year in Philly. He's a walking 20 and 10 player. And Philly, and, excuse me, and the Clippers just got that. Again, a lot of people are mad, like, oh, you gave up those bench players. You gave up some future draft picks. This is not good for a diva. The Clippers are going all in. This is what, year five with PG and Kawhi? They went to one conference title and Kawhi didn't even play in that game? They need to win a chip, especially when Big Bro has been to two conference finals and won a championship. They're going all in. They're already so depleted draft potential-wise in money. I think they play the most in luxury tax. Maybe the Warriors play them up, pay the most. They need to go all in. Like, hold on, relax. This hard thing's going to work. And it, it showed last night. And if Westbrook can also play efficient and give you 17, the issue really last night was just Paul George play like a bomb. He, he looked like p- pandemic P. He was 12, 211. And 10 points. And it came at like the absolute worst time because the actual bum, Julius Randle, had 27 points, shot around 50, like 40%. Julius Randle, who has been horrible all year, probably the most negative player in basketball, had his first good game. And it had to come at the worst time. Julius Randle plays like Julius Randle. Paul George plays a bit more like Paul George. Like Kawhi didn't have a crazy game. The Clippers probably win that. But everyone's saying they gave up like their best depth pieces. No. The best death players, Norman Powell, had 14 great efficiency. He was still there. Plumlee, their backup rotation center, he's still there. Um, Bones Highland, he's, he's he's a little, you know, jittery, inefficient little guard on the bench, but he, he, he's still good. He had a nice little contested three. And Terrence Mann, who's key that they didn't give up, Terrence Mann, who, who can give you double figures every any given night, hasn't played all yet. He has a sprained ankle. And then P.J. Tucker gives you, like, 10 minutes, hustle, whatever. Couple maybe a rebound or two, a corner three, a free throw. The rotation solid. Do I like Westbrook and Harden starting next to each other? Eh, probably not. But last night it looked good together. The issue is Paul George wasn't good, and the and Julius Randle was in the next one on the run. Relax. The Clippers are fine. James Harden, I'll say this again, is going to be and will be and look like it last night more valuable to this team than any of those role players. That they gave up. And cry about the picks. The Clippers don't care. They're going all in. They have a new stadium. They need to win now. They want a championship going in the stadium. They want a good team going in the stadium. They don't care about the future. The Clippers will figure it out. Okay. I want to thank you guys for listening to Some Casual Takes Episode 74. I'm going to try to get more podcasts out, guys. But I'm going to make no promises because I don't like making promises and not filling them. But I'm grinding now. i got my schedule. Trying to figure out my schedule. I'm grinding because I love coming on here and ranting for 30 minutes. Pretty efficient pod. Only like less than 30 minutes. I want to thank you guys for tuning in on Twitch. And to all the YouTube viewers, I see you guys who leave comments and like the video. Appreciate you guys as well. Follow my social media. Some casual takes is the handle on everything to stay updated on all things related to the show and get some nice content. Sometimes I might drop a story on TikTok that you'll not see unless you follow TikTok. But until... What I say next show is, but in just until next show, have notifications on. I'll see you then.